Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or in the comments on our YouTube page during the program. After a discussion with Senator Brown and Senator Shaheen, I look forward to asking as many of your questions as possible during tonight's question and answer period with Senator Brown. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore the fascinating chapters in history in depth with our distinguished guest this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. We're so glad to welcome Senator Sherrod Brown to the Kennedy Library virtually. Senator Brown, Ohio's senior U.S. Senator, has dedicated his life in public service to fighting for what he calls the dignity of work, the belief that hard work should pay off for everyone. He has served in the United States Senate since 2007 and is the ranking member on the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. He also serves on the Finance Committee, the Agriculture Committee, and is the longest serving Ohioan on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Desk 88, Eight Progressive Senators Who Changed America, is his most recent book. I'm also pleased to extend a warm welcome back to Senator Jean Shaheen, the first woman in US history to be elected both a governor and a United States Senator. Senator Shaheen has served in the Senate since 2009 and is a member of the Senate Committees on Armed Services, Foreign Relations, Appropriations, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, and the Select Committee on Ethics. She served as governor of New Hampshire from 1997 to 2003 between her time as governor and election to the US Senate, she served as the director of Harvard University's Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you, Alan. I'm so honored to be able to join all of you at the Kennedy Library tonight and thank you for that very generous introduction for both me and for Senator Brown. I'm, it's so fun to be able to join my colleague, Senator Brown, to talk about his wonderful book. Um, and so pleased to be at the other memorial to John F. Kennedy. I got to serve at the Kennedy School as part of one memorial and the Kennedy Library, of course, is the other. And um, I know that if John, John Kennedy had sat at your desk, Sherrod, that you would have had him as one of the um, progressives in your book. Um, but let me begin because, um, as I have told you, I really liked the book. I thought it was inspiring, and I also thought it was well-written. And I, I'm an English major, so I can speak to that a little bit. And I know that you didn't use a ghostwriter, which is not always true of some of our colleagues when they're writing books. Um, but you have a wife who is an author herself and a Pulitzer Prize journalist, prize-winning journalist. And so I can imagine that there might have been some pressure as you were working on your chapters. And did you actually share those with Connie as you were writing them or um, and ask for her critique? Or did you wait until you got to the end of the book? How did, how did you do that? Um, kind of yes and yes. We both started. Um, she was, she, her first novel just came out. Um, this summer called The Daughters of Erie Town. It's a, it's a four-generation novel of a working-class kid growing up in, on, along Lake Erie in Ohio. And she started her novel about the same time, soon at, a year or two after I came to the Senate and decided I would work on this book that turned into to, um, Desk 88. And um, I, 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 as, I, as, as I could explain later, I picked eight senators and began to write a chapter in each of these eight. And about five years ago, I thought I was, I, I talked to Connie about it, but she doesn't, doesn't write my stuff. I don't write her stuff. Um, but she, about halfway in, about five years ago, I said, I think I'm done. And I showed it to her and she looked at it and she said, you're about half done. <laughs> and it just, I mean, it was not a good week for our marriage, as you can guess, because it, it was pretty painful because I really thought this was the rough draft. And she said, there's not enough of you in it because I wrote about eight senators, but I didn't really, I didn't connect them enough to the present day and 
to our time, Gene, in the Senate that you and I have shared almost every year in the Senate, just two years difference. And so um, it, it, it made the, and, and she was absolutely right. I mean, she is a, a terrific writer. I, I, I've read her novel five times. I, uh, to the point that um, just because I love her writing and because I wanted to see the progress she was making. And she and I, we began to talk about some of her fictional characters as if they were real people. That's how familiar I got with her book. But um, it's, 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 I mean, I, I, I'm a better writer because of her. I'm a better writer because I read good writing. She, she was told as a working class kid in Ashtabula, Ohio, she worked at a diner. And a guy said to her, you want to be a writer someday? And she said, yeah. He said, well, you should read The New Yorker. And Connie couldn't afford the New Yorker. And so she went to the Ashtabula Library every week from about 15 or 16 years old and read the, read the New Yorker. Someone said to me once, to write a word, read a thousand words. And um, Connie became a good writer in part. She's got great natural talent and she really knows how to, she's got great powers of observation and listens well, but she also has been exposed to really good writing. And um, that, that clearly makes you, as you know, as an English teacher, makes you a better writer. Thanks for asking it that way. My, 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 I also want to say something else about Jean. That my when I told when I told Connie, my wife Connie Schultz, that that Jean was going to enter, that agreed to do this interview. Connie just stopped and she said, "Jean," she said these words. I wrote them down. I wanted to get them exactly right. Jean Shaheen sets the standard for grace in the United States Senate. And the longer you know Senator Shaheen, the, the more you understand that. There's a reason she was the first governor, first female governor and Senate in the United States. And there's a reason the second only other person to have done that was a protege of Jean's, and that's Maggie Hassan, who um, has some connections in Boston also. And so anyway, but Jean, I, I'm thrilled that Jean's doing this interview. Thank you. Well, thanks, Cher. That's really nice. And I say that that really speaks to the New Hampshire voter, that Maggie and I are the two women, because well, it's all about the New Hampshire voters, not about us. You no, know, it, it's a little of both, but OK, fair enough. Um, so you give a really good description as you start the book about how we choose our desk in the Senate. And I thought it might be interesting to share a little of that with the audience tonight. And then also tell, tell how you came up with the idea for the book, because I, 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 that's not clear to me. I still, having read the book, I still am not sure how you developed that idea. Yeah, um, as, as Gene knows much of this, certainly, um, all, when you come to the Senate, a lot of things are done by seniority. You, you try to get on certain committees. Uh, you don't get on appropriations or a committee or finance my major committee, although I'm, I'm ranking on banking, but those are the considered the two best committees in the Senate, finance and appropriations. You don't usually get on those your first term. You wait a while. But so it's all it's all done by it's mostly done by seniority. The same with where your office is located, the same with where your debt, where you where you sit on the floor, and so there were ten freshmen in my class, and there were ten desks left to choose from. And someone had told me that senators open their desk, that, that senators carve their names in their desk drawers. So I just being what I did, I don't know. I started pulling out desk drawers and looking at names, and I the de I saw a desk. It said McGovern, South Dakota; T. F. Green, Rhode Island; Hugo Black, Alabama, and then it just said Kennedy. No first name, no state. So Ted was sitting four or five desks away and I walked over. I said, Ted, come here a second, would you? This is my first month in office. And, he's, and he walks over. I said, uh, whose desk is this? Which he said, which brother's desk is this? He said, well, it's got to be Bobby's because I have Jack's desk. So I thought, you know, he probably gets to choose before I do, right? So yeah. I started, so I started looking at these desks. And I one of the things that Connie and I have, Connie, we've kind of taught each other is you really do your jobs better if you know what came before you and you understand uh, a little bit about the workplace and the world you're now immersed in. And so um, Connie, I remember at Christmas that year after I was elected, she went online and got me like 10 books about the Senate, about the Senate, about progressives, about the Senate, about a couple of Ohio predecessors. And I started reading those and I ended up reading in the, you can see in the bibliography of the book, I read probably 160 books, not, not all about the Senate, some of them were things I used from fiction and other things, but um, and, and that's, and I just thought that it, I could just see running, I just chose eight because that was a manageable number, no specific reason, um, but I, I could see a progressive uh, thread running through all of them very unevenly. I mean, some of them were not um, somebody I would really uh, respect or be proud of perhaps in the early part of their careers, and we're all uneven, and we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and and I could see that through these eight senators, and 
Uh, some of them, and all of them contributed in a significant way. I mean, whether they all called themselves progressives, not every one of them did, but all of them contributed to a more progressive nation um, through, the, through the New Deal, through the LBJ years, and uh, only, only one of the eight senators that I actually know, and that was George McGovern, whom I got to know in the last 10 years of his life. The other ones I, I don't, never met. I didn't even ever meet. But, but many of them are very well known. So yeah. Al Gore Sr. and, um, as you say, George McGovern, Proxmire from Wisconsin. Yeah. But there are um, even black, you go black, but there are a few in there that I had never heard of. And, yeah. and no, nor had I. Um, I only knew T.F. Green because our, um, our, our um, two, we have two grandchildren that live in Cranston, Rhode Island, so I knew T.F. Green because of the airport. And then I started reading about him. I, I didn't have any, I, I, I knew Proxmire, as you said, I knew Robert Kennedy, I knew McGovern, and or Herbert Lehman I knew because I knew he was governor of New York. I, but I didn't know very much about any of them except probably Kennedy and McGovern. And then one I knew, I knew not at all, named Glenn Taylor. And right, the singing was, cowboy, right? Yeah, the singing cowboy from Kooski, Idaho. Um, he, had a, he had a son, uh, those of you baseball fans may appreciate this, his son was named A-Rod, as in the baseball player, because his mother's name was Dora and he switched the net, just turned the letters around. Glenn Taylor was a one-term senator from Idaho. He was the running mate for, um, uh, for Henry Wallace in 1948. He was a, he was a pretty interesting guy. And uh, in a career, I mean, he was probably the most courageous, he and Herbert Lehman were probably the most courageous in terms of not worrying about their political future, just standing up and doing the right thing. The others, you know, sometimes ambition trumps principle. And there is a, an example, and probably almost all of us, uh, that, that were ambition trumps principle. And there surely were in some of these senators that um, I could talk about if we get to that. But um, that, in, in including including the one, uh, the family that's that's this this um, center's named after, that the library is named after, and Robert Kennedy. I mean, Robert Kennedy had quite a journey in the last five years of his life were very different from the years before with McCarthy and his brother's campaign and all of that. Well, since you're talking about that, talk a little bit, a little bit about one of the challenges that I think all of the senators you have in the book faced, and that was how do they balance um, the progressive base of that elected them with um, some of the the more pragmatic decisions that they need to make, and do they do they make a choice? How do they how do they resolve that um, choice that they have to make? Yeah, it's not not always clear, and I, I wrestled with the most the most pronounced of that of of, of the senators who uh, did not exactly have a, a proud early history in their careers was Hugo Black. Hugo Black made a choice. Um, he had to decide his his term and the term in Alabama in those days was um, the, the the utility companies, the coal companies, the steel companies who pretty much ran Alabama politics were called the big mules. And he had to make a cho choice between being with the big mules, which he didn't want to be, or the Ku Klux Klan. And he ran in 1926 for the Senate as a member of the KKK. He pretty quickly disavowed it. Um, but he was a member of the KKK. There's no denying it. He acknowledged it. He later wrote the, um, he said, I would have done anything to get elected. Uh, that's a song we often hear and perhaps we all fall into that to some degree or another. But he, um, and by well into, by a second term, he was the author with, the, uh, with a senator from New York named Robert Wagner of the most important labor law of the 20th century, the minimum wage, the eight hour work day, collective bar, it was all kind of the both of them worked on. It. And then Hugo Black became a progressive Senate, a Supreme Court justice uh, to the point after he was one of the authors of Brown v. Board of Education, Hugo Black was burned in effigy um, at his law school in, in Alabama, at University of Alabama Law School, because he was such a traitor to the segregationists in 1950. He was burned probably in 56, burned now. I'm not sure, what, I forget what year he's actually, but within a year or two of the decision. Um, so the other, the other one that I think is the most interesting in terms of courage was Al Gore Sr. And Al Gore Sr. Um, was a always pretty progressive, especially on worker issues. He wasn't, he wasn't nearly the worst on race. Um, he stood up to Strom Thurmond early in his time in the Senate. He did not sign the Southern Manifesto, only 
LBJ and Kefauver and Gore of Tennessee were the only Southerners who refused to sign it. Fulbright signed it, other people whom history might should we might admire later in history. But um, Gore then in 1964 voted for the voted against the um, Civil Rights Act. And his, his children, Al Jr., who I, I can't remember this, was maybe 16 then, something like that, was really unhappy. His daughter was older than Al, and they were both pretty unhappy with him. The next year, he, he was reelected in 64. Um, then the next year, he voted for um, the, the Voting Rights Act. He then turned against the president of his own party against the Vietnam War. He took on Nixon on two Supreme Court justices, Hainsworth and Carswell. Um, he was a very progressive on what he wanted on the tax system, going after corporate interests, wanting a higher tax rate for companies. And um, he lost in 1970. And he kind of thought, I kind of think he thought he was going to lose. He knew, he knew those positions could easily cost him a seat. He had been in, he had an easy race in 64. It was a big year for Democrats, but 70 was a good year for Democrats too. And Gore um, still lost. And he lost because he took on Nixon in the war and the, uh, the civil rights, the anti-civil rights establishment in a, in a tough state, Tennessee. Yeah, I was actually in Mississippi for that campaign, and I remember it being pretty vicious um, against Al Gore Sr. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the fact that after you and I got elected, after President Obama got elected, we did two big things in mm -hmm. Congress. We passed the Affordable Care Act, and we passed um, the Dodd-Frank um, banking reform legislation. You said something about what you think, um, a lesson from your book about how we govern that you think applies to, to getting those bills done and that you think has some lessons for the future. Can you talk a little more about that, what you saw in looking at the progressives and how they got things done? Yeah, the, the, there are there are two and a half progressive eras in the in the scope of this book in the period of this book from the early twenties to the I guess to the present day at least for the next hundred years whatever um, and you know the FDR out of FDR's time came um, Social Security rural electrification um, collective bargaining all the all the labor issues worker issues out of LBJ came Medicare Medicaid civil rights voting rights um, OEO. Uh, Higher Ed Act, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, immigration, a whole bunch of stuff. All, all of those accomplishments, um, they were big things. Progressives don't win often when we do. They, we do big things that have a, dur a durability to them. All of those things, most of that we still benefit from. In 2009, when Jean, my third year in the Senate, Jean's first, we did, as she said, we did, I said two things in the book. We really did a third when we rescued the auto industry and kept the economy afloat. But that was um, that was sort of Nixon, I mean, not Nixon, I'm sorry, Bush, uh, Obama together and kind of what we did. But the two big bills were Dodd-Frank, named after Chris Dodd of just down the road, and Barney Frank in your state, I mean, the, the, the listener state, the viewer state, and, um, and the Affordable Care Act. The, the problem was that by the 2010 elections, no American citizen in New Hampshire, Ohio, or Massachusetts had benefited from Dodd-Frank or the Affordable Care Act. And so there was this, everybody knew we were aggressive, we did big things. The Tea Party, which was really uh, the Koch brothers, which is sort of a dressed up, uh, where they wear a suit kind of John Birch Society. It's the same people, the same kind of people, a generation later, half a generation later. Um, and they, they salvaged, savaged us and we didn't fight back because we hadn't shown anything. And the lesson I think for us in 2020, and I, I, I think that, that Biden very well can win my state. If he wins my state, it's an electoral college landslide because Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota are easier. New Hampshire's a little bit easier, not much. Florida's a little bit easier. So if, if that happens, um, when we govern, we've got to do a number of things. We've got to do, we want to do big things that, that are durable, that will last for generations on, on the three great moral issues of our time, climate, income, despair, and uh, race, racial disparities and income and, and, um, and income inequality. But we need to do things that people will benefit from and feel it. So if you're gonna vote, if you're, if you're living in New Hampshire, you vote for Joe Biden and Gene Shaheen, then in 2021, you see the minimum wage increase, you see the child tax credit expanded, you see a Medicare buy-in at 55 if you choose to, um, you see the overtime rule reenacted. You're going to think, you know, I voted for Shaheen and Biden, and I got some. My life got better. 
So that's what we have to, we have to do big things long-term. We also have to do things that people are going to see within a year by the time, by summer of 2022, when Maggie's on the ballot and in my state, the Republican senators on the ballot, I want to be able to say, look what we did in this first year and a half to make people's lives better. The other thing we have to do is what Republicans always do, and that is they, they always find way to, to, to build their political muscle when they're in office with right-wing judges, with attacks on labor unions, with, um, with going after voting rights. So we have to, the first thing we should probably do is pass the John Lewis voter rights bill, whatever we're gonna call it, something like that, thing, things like that. And, and, and the PRO Act, protecting the right to organize so unions have a level playing field, because that, that will be, that, that's what we need to do in, in moral terms. And it's what we need to do to build the political muscle so we can fight back when they come after us in the most aggressive way and Fox piles on all year, all two years in 2022. So one of the biggest challenges we have right now is the coronavirus and how that pandemic is affecting people and the economy. You tell in the, your thoughts that are your reflections after each chapter um, on the chapter on Senator Proxmire, you tell a very, uh, I think, a very touching anecdote about your father and tuberculosis and how he um, pulled over and, and showed you um, the solarium where tuberculosis patients had been treated. And then you go on to talk about how we have um, virtually eliminated TB, um, smallpox, um, how we address smoking and tobacco use and the impact of that. Are there some lessons from what you saw in the book from thinking about how we address those um, health issues that we should be applying to the pandemic and how we're responding now to the coronavirus? Well, it's, uh, of course there are, and it's a hard, as you know, Gene, and you've done a lot of work on this, especially for small business to help them weather this. Uh, we had the, I, I, I loved writing about public health. My dad, the, the, the story quickly, my dad, my dad said, my dad was a family doctor in Mansfield, Ohio. And he, um, he showed me this clinic. I said, what is that? He said, they used to, they used to um, have TB patients living there. And we've eliminated that in this country, which was almost entirely true, but not quite at that point. Um, but what, what, you know, the more you study public health, the more you realize that one of the greatest things about this country is what we've done in public health for the world. Uh, smallpox, which has killed literally hundreds of millions of people in the last 150 years, it was eliminated because of American leadership and a whole lot of other people, but it was our leadership through the CDC. Um, uh, uh, polio, and I have a story there. My dad, my dad was on the front page of the local paper giving my older brother, who was then in third grade, the, uh, the Salk vaccine. Um, because they wanted doctors, they wanted, the government wanted to see doctor, have doctors, have to, to assure people that this is safe by having doctors um, give a shot to their child publicly, um, because it must be safe then, right? And, but we as a nation essentially eliminated polio around, the, certainly in this country and mostly around the world. And we, we did a, a, a incredible, if not spectacular job on, on Ebola. And we, um, and we had a public health structure, infrastructure in this country that beginning in 2010, the Tea Party went after it because it's pub, they don't like the word public. Public education, privatize it. Public health, privatize it or eliminate funding. They started going after public health. Then Trump in 2017 um, or 2018 eliminated something called the Office of Global Security, which uh, health security is whose job it was to surveil 40, 40 employees. Their job was to surveil the world and look for potential illnesses, epidemics that could, to, could evolve into pandemics. And Trump just got rid of them. And some of us pushed back at the time. Uh, he just ignored us mostly. And so, I mean, the lesson is be prepared and trumpet the fact that how great our public health system used to be and should be in the future. Um, what, what we do now is obviously the hardest question, but uh, we have a president. I mean, you, you look at the pictures today in Nevada of these, this indoor, this indoor Trump meeting where people are standing up and screaming, and um, it, you know, it's just unbelievable that that they there there are so many people in this. I mean, imagine if the president had worn a mask in March and said this is serious, and and done, and done what he should have done. I talked to Thomas Frieden yesterday. Was the head of the um, the CDC for eight years under Obama. Gene knows him, and he um, 
he was just saying that this this is the kind of thing the CDC would have managed with any other president. Bush would have turned it over to CDC. Reagan, Johnson, Kennedy, uh, Obama would have said to the CDC, Clinton, this is your thing. You conduct the briefings. We we will follow your advice. Now, much of America doesn't believe the CDC. I don't I don't trust the CDC and its word the way I used to. And it's going to be a real battle. It's going to be a real process to build up the CDC's credibility and and um, workforce because a number of people have left and the, the the morale there is terrible. They have a they have an outpost. It's not really an outpost, an office in Cincinnati called the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. It's several thousand people and they're they, they're part of the CDC. They don't get much attention, but they their job is to make sure workplaces are safe. I mean, it's 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 one of the best things of our government and history of our government. What we do with all things public health and public and public health because it it, it really does. It, it really does sweep across everybody and gives everybody something. Well, you're right. And as you say, um, the prestige and the, um, the scientific information that the CDC has had and that people in the country and around the world looked up to for so long is being undercut by the politici politicization of the organization in a way that's really going to be bad for public health. Um, there's no other way to say it. Uh, can you talk about why you think some of the progressive um, actions, um, whether it be, you know, the minimum wage and some of the labor laws, Medicaid and Medicare, why you think they have withstood all of the attacks by opponents of those initiatives? I think because they apply universally. I mean, I, I the, the the reason I I'm a, a little different from some other progressives in that some some progressives think that at some point some point um, the wealthy shouldn't receive a social security benefit, um, and I I don't agree with that because I think the universality everybody pays in. Um, I, I, you know, you, you stop paying into social security at about 140,000. Is that about right? Jane, something like that. $140,000 income. So if you make 280,000 a year, you stop paying into social security in July, uh, Bill Gates stops paying in 10 minutes into the new year or something, but, but it still has a universality to it. And I was, um, my first year, my, my third year in the house of representatives in the mid nineties, Gingrich went after Medicare. And then 10 years later, Bush went after social security and they didn't know what hit them. Because the public, it, it, you know, it's and people, people don't. I, I mean, I, I remember getting letters. Um, I, you know, they, they'd say, "Get government off my." They, they letters from people saying, um, I, you know, I, I forget how they. I'm, I'm losing my thought a little bit here. Medicare. They, 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 they think that Medicare is not a government program. I mean, it's it's so sacrosanct to conservatives, even even to conservatives, that they'll say, "Keep your hands off my Medicare," and and they really do believe it. I don't know if it came, it's in the Old Testament, there's manna from heaven, Medicare, I don't know where it came from, but I mean, they, we, we don't always study history. Well, one of the things I liked about, about studying, reading about George McGovern is McGovern said, anybody that understands history has to be a progressive, because if you really understand history, you, you, you can't be anything else than that. And I'm sure there's some people watching that don't agree with that, but I'll bet most of you do. And, but I just think those programs, the Medicare and Social Security are such a part of our fabric, and everybody's covered. And they were hard to start. Social Security was hard to start. Medicare was hard to start. But once it's there, it, it, the universality of it, I think, keep, keep, keeps it in place and keeps it pretty inviolate. That's a really good question. I have to sign off in uh, just a minute, but I want, wanted to ask one final question before I do. And I know you'll get into a lot more detail with all of the audience members. But um, talk about the afterword to your book. Um, I know you've written a new one for the paperback, but I haven't seen that one yet. But in the other afterward, one of the, the things that I thought was very hopeful was the story you told about your grandson coming in as you signed your desk. Yeah. And talk about what gives you hope that um, we should be optimistic about our future, given everything that's going on right now, both in the United States and around the world. Thank you, and I, I thank you, Jean. I, I wanted to just say how appreciative I have of Senator Sheen. She's on the ballot this year. She's got a multi-millionaire or a multi-gazillionaire running against her. She's got Corin Lewandowski coming in and Trump coming in, and 
New Hampshire is a tough state. It's a one point either way kind of state. And it, it was very generous of her to give any time tonight. And I'm so glad that she could spend close to an hour with us. Um, I, I'm hopeful because I, I out of our darkest times come some of our best times. And I, I, I worry about the 35 or 40 percent of people that will, are willing to vote again for a racist president, um, a president that's that's all the things that many on this this watching this think about him. Um, that's discouraging. I know next year it'll be hard to govern because the the, the Tea Party and the, the right wing and the Fox will still be out there and Trump will be roiling the waters. But I also know that the country really wants change. And I, I, I'm hopeful that this, this country is, I mean, we've, we've had, we've probably, I mean, we, when I wrote the, the afterward in earlier this year in like March, I first wrote it and then they wanted to redraft in August because all that happened. I wrote in March, this is not the worst time in our country's history. It still isn't. It's the worst time in my lifetime, probably, in Gene's life, well, everybody's lifetime, maybe on this watching. But um, I, I, I look at um, how resilient we are. I look at the, the activism of so many people. And I, I look at this next generation. I mean, they're, they're younger. They're more diverse. They, they will demand we deal with the, the, the great moral issues of climate change, of racial disparities and income inequality. My wife teaches Kent State journalism students, mostly working class kids. And she's just really encouraged by what she's seen. As hard as it is to go to college now and deal with, particularly if you don't have any money and you're struggling. And I just see the human spirit in this country come forward as it, as it always does. Uh, and um, I, I, and I, I, I so depend on, not on our generation, but on, a couple of generations behind us, really, and how, how they're just really taking hold. So, well, thanks. This has really been fun. I'm thanks so for me, too. Thanks. Opportunity. And uh, I, I'm optimistic because I know there are leaders like Sherrod Brown who have integrity and who have a vision for the future for making it better for others. And so, um, I know you'll have some great questions coming up. Thank yes. you, Sherrod, and thank you, Alan, for letting yes. me. Yeah, it's nice Senator to see one of my colleagues without a mask on, too. Absolutely. Senator Thank Shaheen, you. while I have you, can I ask you one question before you go? Sure. Uh, the question comes from Dan from Manchester. And he says, how did your work on the Carter campaign impact your career and shape your values? I know that's a big question. Ooh, but like if you that. could, that would be great. Um, well, I actually got involved in politics working for Jimmy Carter. I was teaching in a newly integrated school in Mississippi in 1970 when they finally integrated all of the schools. And my husband and I got interested in Jimmy Carter because he got elected governor of Georgia in 1970. And, um, and when he took office, he gave a famous speech about the need to end segregation in the South. So when he started running for president, we were back in New Hampshire. We went to the first campaign meeting that Jimmy Carter had in New Hampshire and got involved in his campaign when he was Jimmy Who and got to go to the White House. And um, I am still very proud of having worked for Jimmy Carter and everything that he has done, both as president and since then, to make the world better. Thank better you. What a wonderful Thank you question so and answer. Way to go, Manchester. Thank you, Gene. That was great to hear that. That's somebody who knows me, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, Senator Brown. Uh, we've got a lot of questions for you. Uh, sure. I'm going to start. This one's got a bit of a preamble, so bear with me. The question is, uh, I teach U.S. government and politics in Quincy, Massachusetts, home of two other very important U.S. presidents. I traditionally assign JFK's Profiles and Courage for our time in, for my summer classroom read, and I have invited students to attend tonight's broadcast although it is the eve of our first day of school tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This year, I assigned Desk 88, which I love. My question, reaching across the aisle, could Senator Brown name a Republican who is worthy of profiles and courage status and why? Well, the, the easy answer in this moment in time is Mitt Romney, um, who stood up uh, on a number of things. I mean, Rom Romney, I mean, Ron I know Romney was governor of Massachusetts, obviously, and Romney is, um, is a, it, 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 I think a lot of my Senate colleagues didn't really want to like Mitt Romney as much as we have since he came. Even before he stood up to Trump, we didn't quite know that about him. 
because we were probably colored in our viewpoint of what we saw when he was running against the president whom we were all, well, all the Democrats anyway, were supporting Barack Obama. But I would put him in that. I, I would put a number of my colleagues, I, I'll tell, I'll answer this. So it would be Romney would be the answer now. And unfortunately, I think history is going to look back on this time and say, why were, why is almost every Republican House and Senate member um, why do they lack any ability or willingness to stand up to the president? They, they wouldn't even criticize him when he so disparaged men and women who have died for this country. I mean, they not a peep from almost any Republican. So that was pretty disconcerting. But um, where, where, in a practical sense, uh, I can't really find much on profiles and courage, but in a practical sense, there was a, a senator from Missouri named Roy Blunt, and he and I were secretaries of state of our, of our respective states, many years ago. And he told, he's a very conservative guy. He said to somebody, he said, Sherrod Brown and I have known each other for 30 years and we've only agreed on five different things. And then he laughs and he said, and those are all federal law. So what, what you do, and this isn't the standard of profiles and courage, but what you do is you find out what you, what, where you have overlap, where you have something in common with a Republican, you seek them out, you work with them. I do that on healthcare. I do it on veterans issues. I do it on a little harder on banking issues because they're all pretty close to Wall Street, but um, that that that's a way to get something done. I, I it's it's not a there aren't a lot of good answers on the profiles and courage though, but I really appreciate his comments. Thanks. Oh, terrific! There's a great um, book about John Quincy Adams about how he went to the House floor and and read letters from Brookline and Quincy and Braintree about slavery because the House leaders had banned the discussion, the debate of slavery on the House floor. And he did that with a congressman from Ohio named Joshua Giddings. Giddings got expelled from Congress. Qu John Quincy Adams, they couldn't expel because he was a former president. But that was really how he got, he got, I forget the name of the book, but he got a, um, he, he, he got slavery debated on the House floor by the way he did that back in the 1840s, I think. Amazing. So. Amazing. Well, when you looked uh, at the history of Desk 88, are there other senators you wish you could have included, uh, but either because you didn't have enough space or because they sat at another desk, yeah. you could not include them? Well, the one I most wanted to include was Hubert Humphrey, because Humphrey, Humphrey perfected the inside outside way of um, way of legislating that he he worked his colleagues. I mean, I, at the beginning, the Southerners were just they found Trump, they found Humphrey just unrelenting and, and overbearing and something and just too far afield, too far away from them. But he, he worked everybody internally and he was able to organize from the outside, the, the, from um, the, the anti-nuke people back then in the 50s and the, in the early 60s. I mean, Humphrey, I know he went astray with Johnson in the war and uh, that in particularly people my age, a little older, have trouble forgiving Humphrey for any of that. But he was so good on so many issues. And he went from this, from getting people in the civil rights community, put pressure on Congress. And um, I just admired him uh, the, the most of almost any of, of my predecessors in the Senate. I would love to have included him. Terrific. Uh, we spoke earlier about this room raider uh, sure. for people who are broadcasting. We have a question. Can you tell us about the photos behind you? Yeah, um, the question over this shoulder is um, my daughters and me at the 200th anniversary of the, of the Constitution and the three of us at the state on the front of the State House um, are there, our, our um, State House in Columbus are blowing out the 200 candles on the 200th anniversary in 1987. My daughters, one's a legal aid lawyer in Columbus now representing immigrants. Uh, in a, obviously a very difficult time for them in the country and the other is a city councilwoman in Columbus. Uh, and to my over the other shoulder is a guy named John Glenn. And I met John Glenn when uh, this is a little bit too, this sounds made up from a guy in the Midwest, but John, John Glenn, I was an Eagle Scout. I was the third of three boys. My mother gave me no choice but to be an Eagle, to stay in until until I became Eagle because my brothers were. And there was a dinner of 50 Eagle Scouts in my community. Um, from all the different troops and John Glenn was the speaker. And I remember he very patiently stood and talked to each one of us individually. On um, the other, the one in the middle is a, um, is a, uh, uh, a, a like a, a little poster of FDR. And we, 
my wife and I have two dogs. One of them's named Franklin after FDR. The other one's named Walter after Walter Ruther. <laughs> that tells a little bit about my <laughs> politics. <laughs> oh, delightful, delightful. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, Desk 88 and your research on it, uh, how did you, what was your research process like? Uh, what other books did you have to consult? Uh, what other interviews did you have to do? How did you get that depth of information? Um, it was really good. I, I have no research skills that I learned in college. I, I know that a group like this will have a number of people who know a lot more about research and history than I do. Um, it was really just a reading and interviewing people. My, my, so I, I, over time, I mean, I, I didn't know much about very many of these eight. I, as I said, I knew a lot about McGovern and Bobby Kennedy, but not that much. And so it was just reading and reading and interviewing people and asking people that knew more than I did about them to tell me what, give me ideas. Um, the, the, bad, the most fun interview was uh, Glenn Taylor uh, from Idaho. His son, I said, was named A-Rod. And I'm not all that good on, on, on social media, on, on research online. It's more books with me, I guess, from, from the way I've done it. But I found out that Glenn Taylor's, Glenn Taylor's son, I read well, there are two books about Glenn Taylor, one written by him and one about him. That's all I really could find other than interviews. And his, um, his, his son uh, is named A-Rod, as I said, and he's a dentist. And I found him in California uh, practicing. This was 10 years ago, and I, I, I regret I don't know if he's still living. He was in his mid-late 70s then. I called him. He was very suspicious because his dad was very controversial, was run out of Idaho, out of the Senate, largely by the McCarthy, by the McCarthy forces in 1950, with, along with many others. And he, um, once he got comfortable, he talked to me. And he, the, the story he told, which was so wonderful, was in 1948, when he was running with, um, with uh, Henry Wallace as the running mate, he went to Alabama to campaign. And Alabama, of course, was very segregated. Black people weren't voting. Glenn Taylor spoke in front of a, of in front of an integrated audience. This is all coming from A-Rod, his, his son. And he was speaking in front of an integrated audience and he was arrested by, get this, Bull Connor, who mm -hmm. we know from the horrible things he did in the 60s in Birmingham. But he was the co police commissioner then, arrested him. He spent the night in the Birmingham jail. And as A-Rod told me, that was when Martin Luther King was still in high school. So he knew about the, the Birmingham jail before Dr. King wrote the, you know, maybe the greatest yeah. letter, letter ever. Oh, fabulous connection. Fabulous connection. Uh, you know, these days we still hear a good bit about trying to restore the Senate uh, and uh, have a less divisive set of politics. Is there one innovation that you think should be made about how the institution is constituted and functions that would help this process? Yeah, I, I think there are, there are sort of two questions there. The one is, would it make it more civil? Mm -hmm. uh, like, do you want to make it more civil? Do you want to make it more productive? And I guess it doesn't matter who, who, who's making it more productive, right? I, I would go for the latter. I, I don't think American politics right now is going to play in the divisiveness in American politics. We're not going to all be kumbaya in the U.S. Senate. I mean, we all, mostly, there are only three or four senators I really personally detest, and I'm not going to tell you who they are, but you probably could guess. <laughs> um, I know that's not really true, but there are, I mean, most of them are human beings, and I, I want to like, I mean, I, I like, I mean, I, I, I started just in the practice of politics over the years. It's, I always, and I tell younger people this, it's whom you fight for and what you fight against. You don't want to make it personal. It's whom you fight for and it's what you fight against. And it's important to always remember that. But I think the most important thing is to eliminate the filibuster because we have a government now in 2018, 2016, close in 2014, in 2012, 10, 8, and 6, Democrats won, got more votes across the country for the U.S. Senate than Republicans did. That's not our system. I understand that. Um, and for president, six of the last seven elections, as you know, Democrats have gotten more votes. So Republicans, even though more people vote for Democratic senators, more people vote for Democrats for president, um, Republicans run the Senate, the, the, the White House, and the Supreme Court. And, uh, and so uh, the dysfunction, if we have, if we don't eliminate the filibuster, I don't think we can I just, I think we'll be paralyzed next year when, because the best we'll do is pick up 
four, five, six seats. We might get to 53, we'll, we'll never get to 60, at least not this cycle or any foreseeable cycle. And so McConnell, if he's still there or the next McConnell, I mean, few people are as good at this as McConnell and good at obstruction and good at cynical politics as McConnell. But um, I, I don't think that, I think the country would be so unhappy to elect a new president and nothing much happens. So uh, I, I think the filibuster, filibuster's democracy. I, I, I mean, getting rid of the filibuster brings more democracy to the Senate. Uh, no chance for term limits as a, as a possible avenue for reform? No, I don't, I don't think term limits, I, I don't think they've worked. I, the Republicans have term limits on committees, committee uh, chairs. And I don't think, I mean, one, one reason, I mean, experience counts for something. And I mean, it's easy for me to say because I've been there a long time. And, but I, I, I just think that I don't think term limits in the legislature in Columbus, they, they flip from House to Senate back to the House. There's all these ways kind of around term limits. And I think you end up, when you have term limits, you end up giving lobbyists more power. Ready for 10 years, you learn these issues and you learn the trap. Right. What's the most surprising thing you learned while researching this book? Um, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe I, the most surprising thing I've learned is, and this, this will sound a little self-serving, is I, I don't think Americans, I've kind of always intuitively thought this maybe, but that Americans don't, we don't pay much attention to, to or learn much from our history. That, um, I, I, I've talked and I, I'm not disparaging anybody I, I work with, but uh, so few of my colleagues knew anything about much of any of these people. Um, and I mean, Gene was an exception. Gene knew most of them. I, I didn't know all of them either. I'm not saying I was an expert in all of them. So I think maybe that's it. But I, if you had given me, if you give me a day, I'd give you a better answer because I, I, I don't know what the most surprising thing was. Maybe the most surprising thing was my wife said that it's only half done. You got to go back and work. That was, <laughs> that was the worst surprise. <laughs> well, you've got at least 99 other desks to write about. Do you have future projects <laughs> outlined? I'm done with that one. I'm done with that. <laughs> uh, how do you define progressive in this time? Well, first of all, I'll say what it's not. It's never racist. It's never anti-Semitic. Um, progressive, populist, some, those words sometimes are interchangeable. Um, populists are sometimes, I mean, sometimes the media describe populists um, the, 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 the sort of populist strongmen that I don't think are populist because they really don't care about people any more than the president of the United States does now. Progressives are, 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 are suspicious of concentrated private power. Start with private, the wealth and power privately held and the influence they have on our government. Progressives um, stand up and give a voice to people without a voice and power to people without power. I mean, progressive is you challenge interest groups. Uh, you challenge whether it's tobacco companies or the gun, the gun lobby or power or the oil companies. Uh, that's sort of that's who progressives are. And I, I thought about the one of the one of the, the sort of I, there was a there's a wonderful uh, Emerson, uh, obviously a Massachusetts, Massachusetts somebody from your state. Emerson one time said history is a battle between the innovators and the conservators. The conservators are those people that want to hold on to their privilege uh, and and expand their privilege. The innovators would be progressives in today's terms, want to move the country forward. And I, I, I one of the one of the things I liked most writing about and researching was tobacco and the power of the tobacco companies. And it it occurred to me, I was in the house when the tobacco companies. There was a famous picture of 25 years ago when all these tobacco executives came to Congress. Ed Markey was on the committee with me in those days in the House and raised their right hand and, and, um, and pledged to tell the truth. And then they lied about nicotine one after the other. And it really, it really struck me. And I thought a lot about that industry. And, and in the United States, about 1,300 people a day die from tobacco-related illnesses, about 1,300 a day. Um, pre-pandemic. I don't know if it's changed significantly since then. And it occurred to me that if you're a tobacco executive, you got to find 1,300 new customers every single day to make up for it, for the customers you've lost. And that's what motivates the tobacco companies. And when, when the U.S. finally, the attorneys general and others around the country, and finally Congress put all these rules in place so tobacco companies couldn't solicit children, especially like the way they had, they first went to kids to get the 1,300 a day replaced 
customers, and then they went overseas. And I, I did some work in Poland before I was in Congress, and I was there at the time the communist government fell, and the first billboards up all over Prague, I mean, I'm sorry, all over Warsaw were um, tobacco billboards. It wasn't the Prague Spring, the crocuses coming in Prague Spring. It was, it was the American tobacco companies wanting to sell cigarettes in Poland. And they, they, they miss not a, not a beat in, in their advocacy and their aggressiveness. And, um, you know, poor countries can't really fight tobacco companies. They've got to fight cholera and malaria and TB and HIV AIDS, and they don't have the resources and tobacco companies know that. Uh, super. As you may know, we house at our library not only the JFK papers and artifacts, but also uh, his brothers, uh, Ted and Bobby. And I am curious to know, uh, what more can you say about Bobby Kennedy, his work in the Senate, and what about his presence at Desk 88 is memorable yeah. for you? Well, I'll start with saying Teddy, I think, was the best senator in U.S. history in the last 20 years of his time. I mean, the Kennedys... I, I, I tread very lightly here because I don't have the expertise in the Kennedy family that many of you do. But the Kennedys, the, the three boys that were in the Senate, all were, all were not, and all of them got a lot more serious and better at their jobs as they, as maybe we all do, but their, their beginning career and their end of career, their last few years were very different. Bobby was, um, you know, Bobby worked for McCarthy and Bobby, um, Bobby was, uh, I, I, my, my favorite Bobby story that's in here is Marion Wright, who was the, um, Marion Wright Edelman, we know her as now, with Children's Defense Fund. Mary, Marion Wright and my wife and, and her husband, Peter, and I had dinner back about 10 years ago. And um, she, she didn't like the Kennedys because she was working for Head Start Mi Mississippi. And when Head Start was created by LBJ, Southern states wouldn't implement it. So it was implemented privately. Um, and she was hired to, to run Head Start in Mississippi. And you know the story of Bobby going to the Mississippi Delta. And she had no use for the Kennedys, this young South Carolinian black woman working in Mississippi, because she knew that JFK's federal judges in the South were all passed on by Eastland, the segregationist chairman of the committee, the Democrat, Southern Democrat from Mississippi. So if you follow the civil rights decisions in the South in the 60s, the best decisions were always the Eisenhower Republican judges, not the Kennedy Democratic judges. So Marion Wright, then Marion Wright, later Marion Wright Edelman, had no use for the Kennedys. Bobby came to Mississippi with this young hotshot, I believe from Georgetown, named Peter Edelman, whom she later married. She had no use for either of them. Bobby walked into this very, this very poor area of the Delta, and she said he sent the television cameras out of the room he picked up a, a, a little baby who was clearly sick and dirty and, and, or dirty if not sick, I don't know. And she picked him, when Bobby picked him up and she, this baby and she said, I, something like, I'm not sure I would have wanted to touch this baby. And she said, he had such a kindness and an empathy. And she later, she said, he, he, is, he is so open to, to life. He's so open to, um, to suffering. And that's who he was. And I don't, I don't know that he was like that when he was 25 or 30, but he's surely like that when he was 35 in the rest of his life. So um, I, I just think that he just had the best, the most of any of these people he had, these senators, he had the most remarkable growth um, into being uh, the, the, the person that, that I admired when I was in high school, the, Bobby, the only Bobby Kennedy I really knew anything about was the last, really from the speech in South Africa, um, until his until his assassination, right? The ripple of hope speech. Yeah, yeah. Super. Thank you. The um, you mentioned earlier this evening uh, big issues uh, being climate change, voting rights, disparities uh, in economic uh, inequality is issues that we really need to work on. Uh, the question comes in as what about immigration? Uh, immigration seems to be a big issue, and how do we work on that? Well, we've got to, we've we've got to do DACA first. I, I I'm not a great expert in immigration. I, I should be more because my daughter, as I said, does does it for a living with legal services. Um, but I, I I looked to Dick Dick Durbin on this issue, who is um, the the sort of the most um, has the most depth and I won't say has more compassion those, but the most depth on on this issue. 
Um, but uh, we have to remember we're a nation of immigrants and immigration. Uh, we have gone, I mean, we're just playing, we played so much defense during the Trump years that I think that there is so much pent up um, desire and frustration and anger from so many that have been mistreated that um, we, we probably go back to the bill we passed in the Senate that the House killed in the mid part of the 20 teens, maybe 2014. Um, I think we go back to that bill um, as the starting point. Things have changed enough in a half in a half decade since, but um, we've we've we absolutely have to to address it. Very good. I should have expected this question, given that we have an election coming up. But the question is, how do you perceive the usefulness of the electoral college in today's society and system? Should it be abolished or reformed, and if so, how? Yeah, of course it should. It's, it's a remnant, as the Senate is, in many ways, of slavery. I mean, it, it, I, I didn't know this until a year or two ago. I read that, that Adams would have beaten Jefferson in 1800, 1800 if, if not for the three-fifths that um, Jefferson got more electoral votes because the South had more citizens because Black people were three-fifths of a person except when it came to having any rights. So the Electoral College, um, you know, 50 of something that these numbers aren't precise, 50 of the first 75 years, something like that of our time as a nation, uh, were um, the president was a Southern slaveholder, 50 of the first 75 years, or roughly two thirds. I, I don't know the number exactly. Um, the exceptions, obviously, Adams and Adams, those were the first, those were two of those, eight of those 20 years or so that there weren't. Um, so the Electoral College, is, is, there's just no reason to have an Electoral College. I mean, look at the, you, you, you get no attention except people come to Massachusetts to raise money, but you get no attention um, in the presidential race in the general election, nor does Rhode Island, nor does Connecticut, nor does New York, nor does Idaho, for that matter. Um, my state used to irrelevant. Run, what's that? Electorally irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, electorally irrelevant. And, I, uh, and um, my state gets a lot. It gets less now because we're not, I think we're still a swing state. I think we can win there as Democrats. But, um, you know, all the attention is in like six or eight states. And that's just, that's just ludicrous. Any, any hope for actually advancing that agenda? I mean, the only way it happens now, I think, is there is a, there's an effort among a, among a number of states that um, the legislature has passed a law in a number of states that our electors must vote for the winner of the popular vote. And the only states that have done that have been democratic leaning states, like I believe California and New York have done it. I think Illinois has done it. I think some smaller democratic states like Rhode Island have done it. I'm not sure which states, but if once there's a critical mass of that, then it's essentially done away with. But I don't know. I don't know how long any of that takes. I, I don't. I, I think there are there's a real interest among Democrats if we win of doing some major electoral reforms. I think that one's probably a bridge too far and just too hard to accomplish when there's so many other things that are that are probably more important now. One of the things you said earlier uh, around a point of optimism is the engagement of a younger generation. Uh, and whatever the circumstances may be in this moment, it has caused a lot of young people to get more active, lift their voices, and get involved in shaping their communities and the nation. What would you say to a young person who wants to be more politically active? How would you encourage them? How would you direct them uh, so that their activism could serve the nation in, in some positive way? Yeah, I, I find out, think about what you care the most about. What's the most important issue uh, that you and maybe your friends care about the most? Is it, is it climate? Is it with the fires, especially, and all the terrible weather patterns we're having, you know, or weather disasters we're having? Is it is it race? Race is a structural racism. Is it income inequality and wealth inequality? Is it is it life expectancy? Is it infant mortality? And devote your devote your efforts to that, and politically or or otherwise, get involved in. And you, you'll be surprised. I mean, during the pandemic, it's all different, of course, but you'll be surprised if you volunteer for a campaign how quickly you can rise into a position of responsibility, not, not so much in the presidential general election, but through the process and all kinds of levels of races, you get involved, you, you will learn things, you will find if you, if you have the time, I mean, you've got to support yourself unless you've come from money and you can live with mom and dad, but you find that you find 
that you will develop an expertise and you'll decide then if you want to do it. I mean, if it's something you, you might want to run for office by watching it up close. But I think the most important thing is find out what, just think to yourself, what, what moves you the most? What's the most important problem in our society? And what's the, what's the best way to address it? Is it electorally? Is it joining a local food co-op and doing something that way? Is it joining an environmental group or, a, a, or, a, or the urban league and doing things in your community? Whatever works that way. I think uh, much has been said about some of the downsides of social media, but I do think that one of the upsides is it does make it easier uh, for young people to get involved and mobilize. Yeah, it surely does. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. We have a question about, could you tell us a little more about Glenn Taylor's unusual path to the Senate? Sure. Glenn Taylor, um, he was a musician and he and he and his wife, Dora, Glenn and Dora Taylor were the Glenn Dora singers and A-Rod would go with them. He was an only child then and they would call on him to speak and he'd pull into a little town in Idaho and he'd have a banjo and a whatever he played, I don't remember. And, and the three of them would sing and he would collect money. And one day he, he was, um, he had a Massachusetts connection in this way. He read the book by, um, I'm forgetting his first name, Gillette who was the founder of the Gillette Company, I believe in Boston. I think this, that part's right. Um, but he, anyway, he read the book by Gillette about, who was essentially a socialist and a challenged wealth. And he read that book and then he, um, he went, he was at a, he was in a small town and he stuck his head into some, some church or something. He saw a politician speaking and, and he said, I can do that better. I'm, I'm a performer by nature and that's what I've been trained to do and what I do for a living. And he thought he'd try to run for office and he lost, I, I, I should remember this, but it's been a while since I read this part, but he lost in 38, he lost for Congress, then he lost for the Senate two or three times, then he got elected, then he got defeated, then he lost two or three more times. His, his win loss record was something like one in seven. I mean, he won once out of many races. And he thought, he was fairly young when he got to the Senate. He's in his, I believe, early 40s. And he thought he'd have a long career in 1944. And he had one term, partly because he ran with Wallace in 48. And that so tarred him with a socialist, almost communist um, uh, brush that he never really recovered from that. And he held all kinds of jobs. He was a tool and die maker. He was a toupee maker for why manufactured toupees. He was a blue collar worker. He did it was an entertainer. He had an unusual life and he was, um, and, a, and a guy that might not, I mean, I, I have no idea what he was like personally. I mean, he only had the one book about him and the one book by him and my conversations with his son and with a few people in Idaho. And, you know, he was 70 years ago, he was in the Senate. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. It does, it does remind us all that the, the House and the Senate are of the people. Yeah. There, there, yeah, it's, it's all kinds of characters and still is. I assume that we're a little more of, well, I mean, we're except that it was all white men then, but we're, the, 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 the diversity, there's, you know, there, we're still all pretty privileged to get these jobs. Not everybody sure. that came here was privileged from growing up, but there's certainly, uh, I, I don't, um, I never like hearing my colleagues, any, and none of, none of us should complain about any of this work. I mean, we do it because we want to do it. We do it mostly because we love it. We have an opportunity to serve in a, the, the most influential country in the world and fight against bad things and fight for good things. And what's not to love about that? Wonderful. Uh, you know, this is a, a very broad question, but could you share some of your thinking about our country's future? Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I, I again, this, I, I, I really do think that the, the books I read show that you really, that out of the darkest times can come some pretty great things. And, and um, this is the darkest time of my lifetime and the lifetimes I assume of all of you. And I mean, not personally dark times necessarily, but for our country. And um, I just think that I, 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 something tells me it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a much better time in the next decade. I think that we're going to, um, I don't believe that America's on the decline there's evidence you could argue that for sure. I think a, a Trump victory in 2020, I would not be optimistic for the future. That's my bias, perhaps. I think it's pretty factually sound, but it's still my bias. 
Um, but I, I think we're going to, I think we're going to meet the, the challenges of climate change. I think it's going to do a lot of damage, but I think we're going to meet those challenges. Um, I feel more hopeful about, about race than I have my whole life. Uh, because, you know, I think three things happened that, that, that made much of white America look at race differently or just to be more aware, aware of structural racism. I think polls show that Americans are more aware of structural racism than white people are. Three things happened. The pandemic as the great revealer of, of racial disparities and so much else about injustice and the legal system, housing, uh, the, the economic system, healthcare, everything. Um, the second thing that happened is we see every week or two or three, another black man killed by the police. And the third thing is we have a racist president. And I think those three things have sort of come together to wake up much of white America that didn't want to see it. And that's why I think we will be much more serious about about addressing the issues of racial disparity. It's still going to, it's, it's always going to be hard. There's still always going to be the the Trumps of the world and their sycophants in the Senate and House that continue to play to race and try to win elections based on race. And, but this next generation is so much more diverse. I mean, I, I, don't, I hardly know anybody under 40 that doesn't support marriage equality. I don't know many people under 40 that aren't pretty good on, on race. They've done, I'll put it this way, I don't know too many people under 40 that, that deny in any way that there is structural racism in this country. Uh, and that tells me and I don't know much of anybody under 40 that doesn't think climate change is, is a real threat to our country and to our, to, to our, to our world. And those are the things that give me hope when I, I see that, that, I mean, when I, I was in college, I went to Yale and I was there in the early 70s. And, you know, we were more liberal than, than you know, the, the students always were. And, and we voted in okay numbers. But I, I just think, but we weren't, a, we weren't a diverse class or group. Um, and we weren't the challenge to the power structure in any way. We thought we were, but we really weren't. But but this generation is because of its diversity, and probably because of social media, for good and for bad, um, just is more aware of much of the world around them and the injustices that um, that they inherited from their parents and grandparents, and that that there are enough of them, enough of a critical mass of them that want to change. I think. I mean, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, if you'll allow me to loop back uh, as we close out on the sure. very first question uh, I asked, which is we've got a, a teacher who's uh, assigned your book over the summer and school is going to start tomorrow. And traditionally they do the Profiles in Courage, but they're going to discuss Desk 88. Is there a particular question you'd like that classroom to reflect upon or wrestle with Ooh. as they better understand your book and that bit of history? Ooh, you ask hard questions. I, mean, give, give, I give, can only give, imagine give, what give, that teacher is going to different ask. ways I stall and think about this. A question <laughs> that, that, that I would ask them or they would ask me or they would think about, give it to you, me again. You're part of giving them homework. You, you can help shape their classroom discussion. Where do you want them to focus? Well, I, I want them to focus on, on the role. On the, one of the things the pandemic's taught us is that the role of government is pretty central in this country to moving the country forward. And I would like them to think, to, to really explore um, how the role of government can be a positive force in people's lives. It isn't always, I understand that. Um, but the role of government is get, because of government, we've had social security, we have civil rights, we have Medicare, uh, we have uh, generally pretty good EPA when the president's, president enforces the rules. Uh, we have a pretty good OSHA um, occupational safety and health in workplaces if the president enforces it. We have a president now that doesn't. Um, so I, I guess the question then is how, how do we see the role of government and how do we um, make sure that our government reflects what this country stands for? And today I would argue it doesn't, but um, how, do, how do we do that? And that was um, one of the best answer I've ever given, but I'm working on it. So. <laughs> but the role, but the book, the book really does more than anything show the importance of the role of government. And I mean, I, I am a pro-government progressive that I think the government has, governments change lives for the better most of the time in this country. Uh, but when it's in the wrong hands, it doesn't. And it, that's the importance of elections. 
Senator Brown, thank you so much for joining Thanks. us. It was an honor and pleasure to do this. Thanks for the challenging questions. Thank you to our viewers. Glad you were part of this evening's conversation. Uh, I hope you will all enjoy reading Senator Brown's book on Desk 88. And thank you to, again to our sponsors for putting together the uh, Kennedy Forum series. All the organizers, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Alan, thank you so much. You bet. Thank <laughs> you.